Test, test, test. Hello, everyone. Okay, hello everyone once again. Uh, it's five thirty, so I guess it's it's time for us to get the uh, the show on the road. Uh, my name is uh, Radoslav Radmalitsky. Uh, I'm a lead gameplay programmer here at Ubisoft Toronto, 
And I'm, I'm more than happy to present to you this year's Ubisoft Hackers Nest Challenge and this year's uh, Ubisoft competition for making the best game at Hack the North 2021. Um, first things first, and, and without any further ado, I think we are at the point where it's fair for us to start revealing the details about what the challenge is going to be for this year's um, edition of, of Hacker's Nest uh, competition. So first things first, um, uh, again, welcome everybody. Let me start sharing some of the resources and materials that you're going to need to be using uh, in order for you to to uh, to work the challenge today. So the most important bit is our GitHub site. Our GitHub site contains all the source code and APIs that you guys are going to be using. Uh, please make sure to log in there and download the projects that 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 exist on the GitHub. So the projects that you're going to receive from us and the API that you're going to be working with us, uh, the, the folder is going to have two uh, Two projects. One is called UB Game Blank. The other one is called UB Game Flappy Bird. So Flappy Bird, let me just show you real quick what it is. That's the Flappy Bird. So Flappy Bird is just a very, very simple game of a birdie that is flying around and trying to avoid obstacles. The, the, I, I'm using keyboards to, to control the, the, the movement. And this is the, the first, like, um, um, for you guys, like, if you start um, trying to, to work with Flappy Bird, you're going to start working with um, a game that has implemented the basic sprite rendering, the basic animations, some particle uh, emitters, and things like that. Uh, but the other very legal way to run the game, and that's the one that I'm going to be doing throughout the, the, the workshop that you have right now, is to run the blank solution. So the blank solution, I have it open right here. Uh, as the name suggests, the blank solution, when you press F5, it generates, surprise, surprise, nothing. It's just a blank page. There's nothing in it. There's uh, a very blank page for you guys to start working in it. Uh, that's not necessarily the true under the hood, because uh, if you go under the hood and start looking at all the files that the solution has, there's a whole bunch of code already in there. It's just not doing anything useful just yet. It's for your, it's your job, guys, to 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 make it do uh, useful stuff. Uh, but you can see that we have two main parts to the way we build our API. Uh, we have a game engine, uh, which is pretty much most of the things that that we created for you. So this is a whole set of uh, features, components, and, and interfaces that you guys can use to build your own games. And there's also like the layer that's called the game, which is all you. This is where you're going to be putting a uh, bulk of your work in. This is where you're going to be doing most of your code. Uh, however, the, the way this API works is that you are supposed to be using functions and interfaces that are here in the game engine. But <clears throat> First of all, how to go around it, where to find documentation, where to find information on how to work with our API. Well, if you go to the GitHub, uh, your best resource that you can use in order to learn how to work our API is going to be step-by-step -step tutorial. Once you click here, uh, you have a short version that, that is displaying on the GitHub itself. But there's also a full, very detailed version that's going to be available once you click that link. Uh, that's a Google Drive version of, uh, of a tutorial. And that tutorial is probably your most important resource in, in figuring out our challenge right now, because this tutorial will provide you a step-by-step -step guide on how to make a game that, first of all, has entities. The entities are able to be moved using keyboards. Then we're going to be moving on towards like how to move them around on the screen. Uh, there's an explanation how to add sprites to, to be your entities. So there's going to be an explanation how to make it render images that, that you guys can create and, and, and show in the game. And there's also going to be um, a section about how to animate stuff. At the end of the day, if you go throughout the whole step-by-step -step tutorial, what you should end up is a pretty confident game where you can move your character around, jump around, fire projectiles, shoot enemies, have some basic animations, have some basic sounds. And, and, and I feel that if you guys are going to be working in a team, it is a very, very good idea for at least one person to be skimming through this document, looking for information on how to solve problems that you guys are going to be definitely encountering. But I think that the other um, uh, super important thing that I want to mention is what are we going to be making this year? 
So without any further ado, dum -dum -dum, the theme for this year's Ubisoft Hackers Nest Challenge is called The Builder Game. So you can build whatever game you want. If it's a shooter, if it's an RPG, if it's, um, uh, it's going to be a logics game, we don't really care about that bit too much. This is very, very open. But what you have to think about is that this game is going to implement some sort of a building, crafting, placing mechanics that we all know and love from a whole bunch of survival and, and um, uh, uh, open-ended games that you can see on the market these days. Right? I'm looking towards the, the games like, like, like Terraria, like Minecraft, but to me, every single tower defense style of game is also can be considered a builder game because the main point of the game is to build and place stuff onto the level so that they interact with the world and the world can interact with them. At the end of the day, the rest of the theme is super open. So if you want to go for whatever like um, uh, theme you want, you, you can. But uh, we're going to be looking at the competition from the perspective of, first of all, how good your game is in general, how well it plays, how well it feels but also how well did you realize the building feature in your game? And I think that uh, usually when working with any sort of an engine, the, the best way to show what, what the engine can do is to take it for a spin. So we're going to do some coding today. Um, this is me opening up the, the, the blank project. When you open up the blank project, this is what you're going to see. And your entry point, the one that, 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 that most of the people should probably start with, is going to be called Game Board. That's, that's the entry point of our application. And it's going to have a constructor, destructor, and some sort of an update function. So as I showed you before, uh, when you start running the game, nothing interesting is happening. So let's start making something happen. First at first, I'm going to create a player, right? So let's create a function, create player, and make sure to draw that function from the uh, constructor. I'm sorry for that loud noise. Let me just drop my volume up a little bit so no, none of you guys are going to get um, uh, deafened by it. But um, uh, we create, uh, we we are calling the create uh, player function. So now let's try to implement it. So game board, create player. There we go. Builds. See? So in order to create any player or anything really in our game, and this is something that the documentation is going to be talking about in the first step. So again, if you go to your to your step-by-step -step tutorial, whatever I'm going to be showing you right now, um, is is um, uh, is already written in the documentation that you have access to. So you can always go to the original step-by-step -step guide and follow along, and it's going to explain you pretty much the same sort of techniques and stuff that I'm I'm going to be explaining personally to you right now. Uh, but in order, uh, the the way our engine works and the way most of the modern game engine works is that it works on a base of um, uh, it works on the base of entity component um, uh, predicament. So what is entity component predicament? Pretty much entity is whatever exists in game. Entity is whatever is in game. A player is going to be an entity. An AI is going to be going to be an entity. Projectile or an obstacle in player's path is going to be an entity. But on its own, entities do not do anything. They don't have any sort of internal built-in logic. The only thing that entity do have its position, its size, its orientation, its its placement in the game world, as we say. But in order for entities to be useful, in order for entities to do something, we create components. So we build pieces of functionality and logic that are responsible on doing one, one given thing, and we bundle it in something called components. And those components are the things that, that, um, uh, that we attach to entities in order for, for those entities to receive logic. So for instance, we can create a render component. And, and if we attach that render component to an entity, that means that we are telling that particular entity that is, uh, it is allowed to render in a given way on the screen. Right. If we want to have a player, well, we can write a move with keys component or, or, or player movement component. And that will tell the entity that this entity should change position whenever the user starts pressing the keys. And the reason why video games tend to implement that pattern very, very often is because it, it helps us solve a lot of difficult problems quite easy without 
adding too much code duplication. Because as you can imagine, finally in the game, you're going to have plenty of entities. You're going to have a lot of entities on the screen. You're going to have a player. You're going to have an AI. You're going to have a bunch of obstacles. And, and in a classical way, you would have to write logic of everything per entity if you wanted to go like the old school C version version of, 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 of programming video games. But uh, these days, what's more useful is to use components because components can be shared across entities, right? So I can make myself one render component that knows how to render a given entity, and I can reuse that component and use it for both player and AI and obstacles. Now, if we have, if I have a move with keys component, well, that one is probably going to be only useful for player, but handle collision component might be useful for all three of them as well. So that's generally what you have to remember is that entities on their own, they're useless, but entities with components become very, very powerful depending on which components you attach to them and what sort of data you're going to be providing in those components. So. Let's create our first entity. So how do we create our first entity? The easiest way is I need a pointer to a game engine entity. Whenever you see this, that means that we are referring to some internal mechanism of Ubisoft API that we wrote for you. Game engine is the main core engine class of Ubisoft API. And it's not a black box. You can, you can view exactly how this this um, um, how, how those classes look like. You can all, always control G into uh, you can always try to look or um, you know, view the, 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 the systems that I'm talking about because the source code is there, right? So if you're interested how entity is implemented, you can click and you can see this is an implementation of, of entity. If you're confident at reading and understanding C++ code, this is going to be a big help to you, the, 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 the visibility of the source code of the engine. But game engine entity, let's call it player. It's new game engine entity. That's it. Let's try to build it. There we go. So now we have a player. There are a few things that we can do to an entity. As I mentioned on this picture here, we can set it position, size, orientation. Orientation is for the future. It's not important right now. Let's think about position and size. So let's set size for our player to be 50 float, 50 float. And let's place it somewhere in our, in our game world. All coordinates that I'm typing in here are in pixels. So whenever you see 50, that means it's 50 pixels, 50 pixels uh, big. Um, the set size actually uh, expects vector to be put in it. So I have to do this. That's why I colored it red, so it helped me out. The same goes for a position. So let's place our player somewhere, let's say 100, 100. And... We have it called, let's run it. Let's see what's gonna happen. I don't expect much and I'm not disappointed because not much happened. Well, as I told you, entities on its own, they don't do anything. So in order for us to even see anything, well, we have to tell the player that it can render and that it can do stuff with, with its rendering. So the way to do it is the same way as I explained on the picture before is there's a component called render component that is responsible for showing things on the screen. So what we can do is we can do player, App component, and we can do uh, game engine main render component. I think that's how it's going to work. Let's see. Oh, sorry, game engine. There we go. And not much is happening right now. I forgot about very important bit. So we created the entity, but the other thing that we have to do always after creating an entity, we have to register it in, in, in the engine. It's a very important step. The documentation is talking about it from, uh, from, from the get-go, but um, uh, we need to tell the game engine that we made a new entity and that this entity should be added to the game engine. So let's add entity, let's add player, and see what's going to happen now. There we go. So we have our player. This is the, the green box. It's not. It's very unassuming, but that's our player right now. So let's see what the render component really has. I'm, I'm, I'm using a shortcut, but generally speaking, um, uh, um, generally speaking, this is this is kind of like what you can do. So you can always like kind of look up what's what sort of an implementation uh, a given component has so render component has a function called render 
And this bit is responsible for drawing that, that, that square that, that we saw there. And one thing that I can spot from here is that this whole thing is using something called fill color from a value va variable that, that's called mfill color. So let's see where that variable is actually declared. So there is a set. So I wonder what's going to happen if I'm going to do some color changing. So what I can do is I can get that render component from add component function like this. Now I can call render component set fill color, let's have color, let's say red. See if it's going to change anything. Oh, so now it's red. So that's, for instance, one property that we can change. And obviously, we can change different properties here on that, right? We can move that that entity around, but that's kind of boring. But let's just, just see if, if this is actually going to do anything different. But yeah, as you can see, that that, that we have a control over here. So now let's do something a little bit more sophisticated, right? So let's add our first component, our first game component. What I want to happen is for that player to be, so I, I want to be able to move that player using my arrow keys. That's what I want to do. That's the problem that I set up for myself that I want to solve right now. So the way I typically do, do stuff like that, well, uh, we need new components, so we need to create new class. I can use a class wizard for that. That's kind of tool that is super useful. Uh, that's what I use. You can just add a file and name it cpp.h the same way as you add any sort of a class in, in, in C++, but let's, let's, let's use the class um, wizard player move component. Let's just add it. Okay, we have it. I'm just going to drag and drop it to the game folder just so that it's all like tidied up. Let's see what the, it created for me. So it added an include constructor destructor, and that's pretty much it, right? But what we really want to have is want, we want to have something that extends our basic component, right? So we want something that is able to expand that, right? So the way I typically do it is I take uh, whatever class I know kind of existed and just modify it for my for my purposes. So I, I just control C uh, some other class that I have here uh, that was called, yeah, also a player movement component. But generally speaking, uh, what you want is we want to create a class that extends the component and, and you want to be able to, um, to clear it up from everything, anything that is not useful to you. So right now the component virtual methods are update on add to world on remove from world. As you might, expect from uh, from the naming. This one is called when the component is added. This one is called when the component is removed. And this one is called every single frame that component exists in the game. That's pretty much it. So you can see that that my new component is overriding the update on our add to world functions. I also have constructor and destructor. And for the time being, that's pretty much it. From this side, from the CPP uh, side, it's almost okay. The one thing that I need to make sure I remember about is that I'm using namespace game because this, this C++ implementation is going to reside on the game side. Since our component here is declared in the namespace game, I have to remember to use that same namespace game in the C++ version. Let's see if it's going to compile. Of course, it won't. Uh, player movement missing in specifier. There's a lot of stuff that it doesn't like namespace game. Player movement component. Let's double check this. There we go. Some naming issue. What else do we have? Oh, this is a, also an interesting error. It pretty much tells us, well, you've declared the update and on add to world method, but I don't see them being implemented anywhere because I didn't implement them. So what I do is control C, control V here, control C, control V like this, super sophisticated shortcut. If you hold Alt in Visual Studio, you can do rectangular selection, which is really useful for things like that. And let's see if our compiler is happy. Yes, our compiler is happy. So right now we have an empty component. It doesn't do anything. It's just a placeholder empty component. That's, that's what we have right now. So let's start doing stuff to that component. Well, first of all, I have to go back to game board and make sure that our player, the one that we created before, actually receives that component. 
And one way to do that is player add component. And this time it's going to be player movement component. Now it highlights it here because we don't have any include for that player movement component because we just created it. So we need to make sure that we include it. I have a special magical plugin that does it for me, but pretty much this is the line that you need, right? You need to be able to include the dot, dot h file so that this C++ file knows, knows how to parse the player movement component. But that's pretty much it. And even from now on, what we should be able already to check is first of all, whether or not if I create my player, I'm gonna have this on our two old function being called on the debugger. And as you can see, my breakpoint is hit, which means that it's happening. And the other thing that I can check is whether or not the update is actually being called every frame. And I'm pressing F5 right now, and I can see that it is in fact being called every frame. So that update is happening. All right, so that's step one. Let's do something smart with it. Let's start handling some inputs. So what I want to do is I want to move the character with some sort of velocity. So I have static float velocity, 50 pixels a second, let's say, right? And what I want to check is if SF keyboard is key pressed. SF key, let's say left. So if we have, so let's do right. So if we have our right key pressed, what I want to happen is I want the uh, the player to um to start moving right so if is key pressed right so the movement i'm going to store whatever we want to move our character in in a 2d vector because i want to be able to move our character eventually up down left right right so i need a 2d vector for that so that's this vector let's call it wanted velocity and initialize it to zero now, when I have that wanted velocity, what I want to do with it is that when we are pressing right, I want that wanted velocity to be its x value to be incremented by the velocity that we specified here. So by 50 pixels. So that wanted velocity is going to store how much we want to move at this, this exact frame. That's kind of kind of what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, give me a second. Um, so that's kind of what, it, what it's supposed to be doing. So now let's use that velocity to actually move our entity. So let's go game engine. Uh, so let's go get entity, set position, get entity, get position. So I'm getting the current position of the entity and I'm just adding to it the wanted velocity that I set. That's pretty much it, let's try it. It doesn't like a lot of stuff. So it doesn't understand what vector is and it doesn't understand what keyboard is. So what I need to do here is I need to add two inputs. I need to add this one and I need to add the vector one. And again, I can probably do it like this. Add input. Is the compiler happy now? Not yet. Keyboard is keyword press. HPP. There we go. Something else. Oh, and we have undefined game engine entity. So we are missing another include. So this is going to be this one. Let's try again. There we go. So now. What I'm expecting to happen is if I press right, the, 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 our player is going to move right. And it disappeared. So just trust me on this. It did actually move right, but it did it super fast. If you start analyzing our code here, well, this update is going to be called like 120 times a second. So 120 times. If I'm holding that key for one second, that means that 120 times I'm going to move our, our player 50 pixels to the right. That's definitely too much, right? So what we need here, well, we need some sort of a method so we can actually uh, do a movement over time. So one thing that we can do is we can get the time delta from game engine. 
So game engine, game engine main, get time delta dt. This is going to give us a time delta that passed from the previous time the update function has been called. And it shouldn't be anything more complicated than just multiplying that velocity by that delta time. Let's see what's going to happen now. Aha! Great success. I'm holding my key right, and my character is moving right. So how to expand that? Well, let's first of all increase that velocity for a little bit. Now I need this four times. I'm going to do left, up, and down. So for left, what I want is that to be decremented. For up, I want the y to be incremented. For down, I want y to be decremented. Let's see what's going to happen now. Aha! So we have a great success. Uh, funny enough, my controls are reversed. So right now I'm pressing the arrow up, and right now I'm pressing the arrow down. That's because this is where 0, zero is. This is where zero hundred is. It's just the way this coordinate system works. There are plenty of ways to do it. Like like you can you can define it the way you want to define it. But our coordinate system is starting from from the upper left corner. So you got to remember about that. If you want to increase the y, that means that the thing on the screen is going to go down. Which means that those guys we have them reversed. And now everything works as i expected so this is just a short example uh, it took me what like 10 minutes 15 minutes for us to get a basic basic character movement here on the screen and to add an entity and to 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 be able to have some basic functionality of the game now if i would want to start doing some sophisticated stuff so uh let me try to fit in one more detail it's like i can do create object here another function because we're making a builder game right so builder games will probably need to be able to spawn some objects so let me try to do it real quick the way i usually go around the programming is that if i wrote something once i cheat and i do it and i just do it again so i know that i have already created an entity to create a player so i'm just going to copy that piece of code go back to my player movement component and in the create object i'm just going to add it here i'm going to rename the player to building because we're creating buildings rather than players and i'm just going to make sure that first of all we don't want it to have a move component second of all render component yes we want it so let's make it the same size let's make it in a different position what position should we make it well the best position would be the player position so let's do it set position as get entity get position and let's change color so it doesn't interfere with our player color. So this function will just create an entity and add it to the engine. That's the only thing that it's going to do. So what we can also do is just copy this bit. And if the key is pressed space, let's say what we want to have what to happen is that the create object is going to be called. Let's see if it's going to build and compile and do stuff. It did. So now as I'm pressing space, I'm dropping squares behind. Now, funny enough, see what happens when I hold space. Now I'm dropping millions of objects because this function isn't sophisticated. The only thing that it's doing is checking whether or not I'm holding the key at any given frame, right? One way around it and a quick trick. One way around it, what you can do is Boolean. It's key pressed. Be even more specific is space key pressed. Make sure to initialize it to false. At the beginning of the game, the space key will not be pressed, right? Now, if the key is pressed, we turn it to true. That means that we press the key. And if it's not pressed, so if no one is holding the space, what we can check is, well, if it was pressed the last thing, and make sure to clear. So the way it works, as I'm pressing the space, this is going to be true. Now I'm letting go of the space. And the next frame, I let go of the space. It's going to check, well, am I pressing the space? No. But was space pressed? Yes. So make it not pressed anymore and call our function. 
this is pretty much the easiest way for you to implement a pattern that instead of reacting on button presses, it's going to react on button releases. Let's see if it's going to work. I'm holding space right now. I'm letting it go. I'm holding it. I'm letting it go. I'm holding it. I'm letting it go. So that's a pretty neat little trick for you to use if you need the inputs to react on button release rather than button press. Fortunately, this is a very short workshop. So I was able to go through maybe 10% of the content of the documentation. However, lucky for you, we still have the remaining 90% content of the documentation present and ready for you to go on the web page. You're even more lucky because me and a bunch of other super smart programmers from Ubisoft are more than happy to help you out with your competition. We'll be sitting in our booth pretty much all evening today, all day tomorrow, and all until judging. We're going to be sitting on our Discord. We're going to be sitting in our booth. There's always going to be a programmer present on the scene. So please, oh please, if you have any issues, any patterns that you want to check, anything that you want to reach out to us to so that we can technically help you with your competition here, please do so. In the past, there were teams that were not using that opportunity. I'm just going to let you in on a secret. It don't, we don't care how many questions you're going to ask throughout the competition. We will still judge you the same way at the end of the competition. And the teams that weren't asking questions, weren't asking for guidance, weren't asking for ideas that we can provide them, those were the teams that had a tougher time making good projects because they had to figure out stuff on their own. And we wrote the engine, so we kind of know how it works. So uh, I really, really encourage you to, if you run into, into troubles, if you don't know how to solve one of your problems, please reach out to us, and we're going to be more than happy to help you out. Reach us in our booth, reach us on the Discord, write a direct message on Hopin or on Discord to me or any other uh, Ubisoft guy that uh, guy or girl that is um, uh, marked as a programmer. We're going to be uh, thrilled to help you out with whatever problem you have. And other than that, I think that's pretty much it. Walk through the documentation to um, to see all the other uh, amazing features of this engine that I didn't have time to explain to you guys in the uh, in the half an hour allotted time. Uh, make sure to visit us on the Hopin booth and uh, make the best builder game you can make in 48 hours. I think it's going to be super fun, guys. Good luck.